forward its Convention on the Rights of the Child. Jamaica became a signatory in 1991. Unlike all the other previous laws, this was a binding law which required Jamaica to report regularly on the status of children to the United Nations. Again, there was a period of quiescence between the 79 and the 90s, but in the last few years, we have seen laws that speak to the development of children and care and protection of children. When we look at the laws relating to children in Jamaica, we realize that it's only in the last 15 years that we really have paid attention to children's early development, their care, and their protection in any detail. Next slide. Newspapers of 100 years ago, 50 years ago, and 25 years ago were reviewed for their um, articles on children. Very few articles were published on children in the 1900s. There were 14 articles, and they were all on education. In 1956, there were 20 articles seven on education, but social concerns began to emerge, and there were first reports of celebrations of children. In 1981, the articles on education, there were only six, and we had, and their parents now, of a youth in trouble with the law. Next slide. The newspapers, both newspapers were reviewed, both daily newspapers were reviewed in the year 2005. It is very clear what has happened to, to our children by reviewing the newspapers of 2005. Crime and violence and children at risk now exceed articles on education and on charitable donations. Children at risk include accidental death, missing children, child prostitution, and children in children's homes. There are few articles regarding children in the arts, in religion, and health. But one very positive note on what has been happening to us is that parenting education columns now begin to appear regularly in our newspapers with guidelines on parenting. In crime and violence, children are represented in two regards. They're represented as victims and they're represented as perpetrators. Children are also represented in newspapers in cartoons. They may be represented in cartoons that are commenting on general social issues but they are also represented in issues very specific to children. And these, this cartoon and the one subsequently were, were um, published within the last week or two and speak to the concerns that we have about our children of today. One of the first newspaper reports of murder of a child took place in 1913. It took three years before there was another report of the murder of a child in 1916. Delinquent fathers first appeared in 1927, teenage pregnancy in 1979, and HIV AIDS in 1981. It seems that from the early to the mid 20th century, we were in the most socialization period where children were educated, loved, and cherished. Since the latter 20th and the early 21st century, we have a mixed picture. We seem to be very close to the infanticide period and also to the abandonment period, reflecting the increasing numbers of children at risk. But the parenting information that is being given also has us a bit in the helping period. Our children must navigate this confused society that others have prepared for them. And they must navigate the challenges of childhood in many different areas. However, Although the challenges are presented in separate areas, I'd like to point out that children are navigating all these areas at the same time. First, we look at poverty. Links between poverty and child development are the strongest and most widely reported throughout the world. Poverty rates in Jamaica have been between 17 and 20 percent for the last two years. However, it is quite positive that our lowest rate occurred last year. Our lowest rate between 17 and 20 percent, pardon me. Children are not primary income earners. Therefore, child poverty is necessarily a result of adult poverty. However, children are overrepresented among the poor. Children form 37 percent of the population, but account for 50 percent of the poor. Why are children poor? Jamaican children are poorer because more of them live in female-headed households. Female-headed households have less income, 
and that limited income is distributed among a larger family size. Also, youth under 24 years who are less likely to be employed and who can, and who can be termed youth at risk help to perpetuate the cycle of poverty. Unemployed, uneducated youth par participate in a number of antisocial activities, including sexual activity for which they are unprepared, leading to children for which they are further unprepared. Therefore, Jamaican children find themselves not only in the crossfire of poverty, but within the cycle of poverty. What does poverty do for us? Poverty has direct effects. The direct effects are due to a lack of basic goods and services. There's less available food, leading to hunger and malnutrition. There's poor housing and sanitation, leading to poor health. And there's less access to health services. There's limited stimulating material in the home, leading to poor mental development. And there's limited access to quality education. But poverty also has indirect effects. The indirect effects occur via parental relationships, parent-child interactions, and parent decisions. Among children who live in poverty, there are less stable parent relationships, and we'll discuss that a little on, later on. There's less participation of parents in child-centered activities. This is partly due to the fact that parents are working, but it's also due to parents' lack of understanding of the importance of spending time with their child. Limited coping strategies among the poor further impact poverty. Resources are often shifted away from child education and parents tend to have limited help-seeking behavior where when children are identified as having problems, no help is sought. Part of this may be due to access, but part of it may also be due to a lack of knowledge of where and how to, uh, to obtain resources. Research in Jamaica has shown that poverty is one of four factors affecting all children's outcomes at six years. Children's mental development is stunted, stunted that is their cognitive development. Their educational outcomes are poorer, and they are more likely to have behavior problems. Poverty is also linked with poor growth. Poor growth in early childhood is associated with cognitive and educational deficits. Research has also shown locally the longer term effects of the early childhood experience that children who are malnourished continue to have their cognitive defects and their educational impairments going on right into adulthood. This is a very graphic representation of what happens to children who are followed from preschool to grade three. The, bar, the small box to the right represents the number of possessions in the home which indicates the level of poverty in the home. One can see that the children with five to six possessions and seven to 10 possessions, moving from preschool to grade three, their reading scores continue to increase rapidly. Even the children with three to four possessions, their reading scores improve. But the children who have zero to two possessions, the poorest children, we can see what happens to their reading scores. This is the beginning of a pathway of poor education. Next slide. Teachers also report that children from poorer homes tend to have more aggressive behavior. The blue and the yellow represent the children from the wealthier homes where their aggression decreases. Now, aggression is naturally higher in the preschool period and it's natural for, develop, for um, the aggression scores to fall. But one can see that among some children, the aggression scores increase. There are two known mediators of the effects of poverty, whether it's transient and it's timing. Persistent poverty is defined as poverty over 10 years. Persistent poverty has been associated with single parenthood, rural life, a child with a disability, and low parental education. Where there is persistent poverty, children are likely to grow up to become poor adults. The timing of poverty is also important. A quarter of child poverty begins at birth. An eighth is due to the loss of a parent, and a half is due to the loss in earnings of adults within the child's home. Poverty alleviation programs have been studied throughout the world. In developed countries, cash transfer programs where parents are 
parents in distress and poverty are given um, cash vouchers to assist with the care of their child, nutritional programs for pregnant women, infants and children, school nutrition programs, provision of health care, enrollment in quality early childhood programs, and housing assistance have all been child poverty alleviation measures that have been done in developed countries. Home visiting programs has actually been studied in Jamaica. Of all the child poverty alleviation programs, the one that has the greatest effect has been the impact of quality early childhood programs. While cash transfer programs help parents to live in, a better, in better circumstances, nutritional programs to improve children's nutri nutrition, the provision of health care makes sure that children are healthier. When one measures the impact of all these factors on child development, the one that has the greatest impact is quality early childhood programs. The impact of quality early childhood programs have been shown in the short term in the United States to have to end up with children with higher numeracy levels at the beginning of primary school, literacy levels, and better social skills. In Cuba, following the implementation of their early childhood program, Cuba now has maths and language scores 100 points above the regional average of 250. In fact, Cuba's increase in their educational, in the educational attainment of their children is almost exponential. In the long term, quality early childhood programs have been shown to have significant effects. When children who have these quality programs were followed to 27 years, they were found to be more likely to have completed education to grade 12, to own their own homes, to have higher incomes, to have fewer social service needs, to have fewer police arrests, less teenage pregnancy, and less drug use. In fact, they were more able to contribute to society in a positive way. The next challenge that children have is in their family life. And first we will look at family structure, and then we will look at family functioning. Jamaican children must move through changing family structures. We have looked at the status of the union between Jamaican children's parents from their birth to 16 years. At birth, children have an almost 50% chance of being within a stable union, which is described here as being a visiting union, sorry, not a visiting union, a common law or a marriage union, or being in a visit, or their parents being in a visiting union. There's about a 50-50 chance. If one follows the visiting union line, which is a blue line, one can see that by six years, children's parents who started off in a visiting union are no longer in that union. And this gradually decreases to 16 years. If one looks at the line for common law, one can see that common law relationships last a little bit longer between parents. They go on until, they, but they gradually decrease, but they do not reach very low levels until the child is about 12 years. Marriages start off at about 15% and slowly increase to about 25%. But let's look at the red line, where children's parents have no relationship with each other. At birth, that's zero. By the time children are 16 years, more than 60% of their parents identify themselves as having no relationship with each other. But 40% of their parents are in relationships of various types with other persons. Children must make emotional changes as, as parents and their close adults change their relationships, sometimes paying little attention to the relationship changes that children must also go through. Next slide. When we looked at parental absence from the home, the commonest reason for a child not having their father in their home was that the father has never lived with the child. For almost a half of Jamaican children, they have never had the experience of having a father, a biological father, living in their home with them. The next most common experience of father absence is external migration, the relationship ending between the parents or the death of the father. I've also highlighted psychological absence because one of our researchers here has noted that there can be 
physical presence, but psychological absence. And that psychological absence is extremely damaging to a child because it teaches them rejection.